And good morning to you all again. Uh, today we are in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, again, we are going to finish the Sermon on the Mount. We didn't go through the whole Sermon on the Mount, as I mentioned, I think, last week. Um, but the Sermon on the Mount, of course, the Beatitudes and all of the rest of it, is a very important part of Scripture. It's something I would encourage you all to read. I won't read all of it today because it's chapters 5, 6, and 7 in Matthew's Gospel. But it is definitely something you want to look at. Today we are going to look at the end of it. We are in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 29. But I am going to read before that uh, from 15 to 20. Because this bit of scripture, especially verses 21 through 23 in Matthew 7th chapter, are often called the most terrifying verses in the Bible. And if you read 21, 22, and 23 out of context, you ought to be scared. You ought to be scared reading them in context. But if you read them out of context, you should be mortified. So, before I read them, I want to read to you 15 through 20, so that as I read 21, 22, and 23, you might realize what Jesus is talking about. And remember, in your red letter Bible, these are red letters. You pay attention to the red letters, right, Eric? The red letters are ones you pay attention to. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? So every sound, so every sound tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears evil fruit. A sound tree cannot bear evil fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. And again, that's what precedes what, again, is sometimes called the most terrifying three verses in the Bible. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to you, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me. You have behaved lawlessly. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these words, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as their scribes. We'll deal with that last two verses first. It's important to remember that anyone you hear teaching or preaching, they're not teaching or preaching from their authority. They're preaching from the authority of the Scripture. I don't teach you, I don't preach to you from my wisdom. I preach to you from God's wisdom. But Jesus is a different story. That's why you pay attention to those red letters. He is God. When he speaks, you listen. And you listen well. Back to those terrifying verses. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Like I said, if you didn't have that in the context of verses 15 through 20, that right there is scared to live the jeebers out of you. Because he goes on to say that they did all these works. They prophesied in his name. They cast out demons. They did mighty works. <laughs> They might have helped the homeless. They might have fed the needy. They might have done all kinds of things. They might have earned Christmas, Christmas benefits to raise money for toys, for tots, or what have you. They may have done all kinds of things. And even now, as I see this revival going on, some of it troubles me a little bit. I know that there are, there are mixed feelings on that. Some of it looks like showmanship to me. Some of it looks like it's theatrical. Not all of it. Stuff at Asbury, I don't think that was that theater, but I'm seeing some other stuff that I think is theater. I think somebody using God's, using this, this flame of God for profit. 
That takes us back to 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So you have a couple things going on there. You have those people that are a bit of a charlatan, or not maybe a bit, they are charlatans. They may be doing things to raise money, and they may be using it to funnel it into their own pockets, to grift and graft, as they say. But you can also have sheeps, sheep, sheep, excuse me, people in wolf, wolves and sheep clothing, excuse me, I can't talk here, in the pulpit. They come to you and tell you all kinds of things, but they're all based on their own personal goals, their own personal ideas, perhaps even their own personal sins. And I want to warn you about anyone who would preach to you against the word of scriptures and explain it away with overly due rationalization. There are some things we need to take in context. There are some things that are pretty simply stated. And we don't go against those things. We don't rationalize away our sin. Because as Jesus said, not everyone that comes to me has me in mind, has me in their heart. You have Jesus in your heart. Are you doing things for the right reason? Or do you come to church just so that you can be seen? And then when you leave here, you don't do God's work. You don't do God's will. Do you have a sermon that convicts you? Now, if you go through the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm just going to look at it and see what catches my eye, because again, I'm not going to read the whole thing by any stretch. It's three chapters long. But Jesus gathers them on that hillside, and by the way, he probably was looking up at them. He probably wasn't up above the acoustics are better if he's below them preaching uphill. But that's a, a side. He talks to them about the importance of the law. He tells them that he's not there to replace one dot or tittle of the law. He teaches them about your anger. If you are angry at your brother, it's the same thing as having killed him. And remember, James tells you that if you broke one law, you broke them all. He warns them about sexual sin. Warns them about lust and adultery. Not too many folks can escape that one. Not if you've got, you're a human. Teaches them about divorce. Now Matthew puts an exception in there for infidelity on the wife's part. Luke and Mark don't do that. There is no exception in Luke and Mark. Matthew gives you an out. But he also says that if anyone marries someone that's divorced, it's adultery. How many of us escaped that one? I got mixed. careful about your promises. Don't swear by things. How many of us have run and done that? How many of us failed to keep our end of the bargain? Even our, the end of our bargain when we were baptized. That ought to scare you to death. Don't fight back. We talked about that the other day. You don't want to retaliate. You're not supposed to retaliate. You're supposed to be loving. You're supposed to love all people. You are supposed to give. You are supposed to teach. He teaches about prayer. He teaches about worship. He teaches that God is more important about money. He teaches that you're not supposed to worry. Did you get God on that one? I'll guarantee you everybody sitting in here got God on that one. I don't think there's anybody here that gets by on that one. Except for maybe Lily. Lily probably is okay. I don't think Lily worries about anything. Does she? Except for maybe if there's topic, the wrong topping on pizza or something. Yeah. <laughs> don't judge. Be careful about judging others. And then he tells us about the most important rule. Talks about the wide and the narrow gate. Just before this, it is persona. So in those things, and I... Missed, I skipped around a lot, but you can easily see that in the teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, if you were listening and paying attention and applying it to your life and being introspective about what you had done and do in your life and what Jesus is telling you, 
you ought to all be going, oh my gosh, I'm coming up way short. And the deal is, you do. And yet we have verses 21, 22, and 23. What are we going to do? First of all, I'll tell you that I think that those verses 21, 22, and 23 is applied back to those false prophets. I think that's applied back to those guys that are guys or gals. I'm not going to be sexist here, Jerry. Could be, it could be charlatans that are women in the pulpit. There could be charlatans, there could be women that are, that are, there are plenty of them that are doing things in the church today that are leading people astray and doing it under the eyes of God. Those are the people that are going to have a real hard time when you stand before the Lord. James tells you, be careful if you're a teacher. I think most of them have forgotten that scripture. That's to me the most terrifying verse in the Bible. Be aware of your teaching and preaching. These should be terrifying to those who are leading, trying to lead you astray, and that do. But Jesus comes back and says to be hearers and doers of the word. But I'll back up a little bit. I digress a little bit here. The Sermon on the Mount gives you the reason for Mount Calvary. Why is the cross necessary? Why is that other mountain? Well, it was just a hill. They're both just hills. They're not mountains, either one of them. Why do we need the cross? It's because of the Sermon on the Mount. Because you all fall short of the glory of God. That's the message that Jesus is prefacing here. He just told them why you need me, why you need a Savior. Why you need someone to stand in for you at the cross. Because of that, you will be saved. He tells us to do his Father's work up there, too, and I will go on with that, too. Um, in John, we wonder what is the work of the Father. The work of the Father is taught talk to us in John's Gospel. In John uh, in chapter 6, it says, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. That's in the 6th chapter. And further on in the 6th chapter, it says, He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. You have seen me, and yet do not believe. And then it says, For I have come down from heaven, do not, to do not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. And then verse 40, which is the important verse here. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the work of the Father is to believe in Jesus as your Savior. That's what Jesus is telling you there. We need to have John's Gospel, though, to understand that. But John, Jesus goes on here in verses 24 through the end of the chapter with being hearers and doers. He says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. They built their house on the word of Jesus. He goes on to tell you that if you don't, you build it on the ways of this world. It might be the same house, it might be built out of just as good a material, but the foundation sucks. And I'll tell, I'll tell you, if you've just been around any old buildings, you can know which ones were built on the wrong kind of soil. But you can also have someone sneak in, kind of like back there with that, those deceptive leaders, and lead you the wrong way. And they'll cut off your footing, and cut you away. Don't let them do that. I remember at, when we were in Omaha at our gallery, they were having trouble with the sewer line. The sewer line and the building we were in had been built on top of the old sewer line, which is against the code, but when they did it, apparently it wasn't against the code. And so they had to redirect the sewer line. I came in one morning and the workmen were there. There was a young guy with a jackhammer at the corner of my building, right by, he was 20 feet from my door. He's jackhammering away at the corner of the building. And I walk over to him, I said, what are you doing? He says, oh, my boss told me to run the, the, the sewer line through here, but there's a big slab of concrete in my way. And I looked down the hole, and he had cut through the footing. 
I said, you know what that's called? And he says, no. I said, it's called a footing. That's what holds the building up. That's what holds you up. It's Jesus. Don't let some fool with a jackhammer take him away. But Jesus goes on to tell them that they need to do what he, they need to be hearers and not just doers of the work, as I told the children. You can't just listen to the word and be unchanged. You can't just come in and listen to a, an eloquent or an ineloquent sermon, as I would prefer, or not prefer to give, but unfortunately do give. You can't just listen to a sermon and feel convicted and walk out the door and go, oh well, I was convicted while I was in there, but I feel a lot better I'm out in the air. And go about your way. When you are convicted by Scripture, you need to do something about it. You need to change. That's what Jesus is about. That's what that baptistry is about. That's why you don't listen to someone that sits here and explains away your sins. Just because, well, that makes me feel a lot better about myself because I'm not a sinner no more because I guess it wasn't a sin. Maybe the thing to do is to hear about your sin and get rid of it. Or deal with it. Do what you have to do about it. Excise it from your life. Change your behavior. Scripture is not supposed to change for you. You are supposed to change for Scripture. We're not supposed to mold ourselves to the world. We're supposed to help mold the world to Christ. That's our goal. That's our journey. And I think James, the brother of Jesus, and I believe that James is written by James the Just, the brother of Christ, said it the best when verse 17 in chapter 2, he just says, So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. If you say you have faith, but nobody can tell by the way you act, by the way you live, by the way you witness, what good is it? Not any good at all. God wants you in this world to do one thing. He leaves that message with you at the end of Matthew. Go out into the world and bring people to him. Take the message to all the world. And that message doesn't mean that you change it for who you're talking to. You preach the gospel, you preach it real, you preach it clearly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much.